So good evening, everyone. I'm Rodrigo Mansur. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the overlap between mood disorders, specifically diabetes, and the opportunities that it presents for translational applications. All right, so Roger touched a little bit about this, but it's always a good reminder. I know most healthcare providers are very aware of this. Neuropsychiatric disorders, especially mood disorders, are among the leading causes of burden of disease. And they are that impactful because they tend to be chronic illnesses. They tend to have an early age of onset, but also because treatment, unfortunately, is frequently ineffective or only partially effective. We know that some patients do very well with the current treatments, but unfortunately, the hard truth is that a very significant part of the patients don't. And some study shows insufficient response or poor response in even 50% of our patients. This is an interesting example. This is a, uh, a study that used a multimodal approach to treat bipolar disorder in this case. It involved what is considered to be the gold standard in the treatment of bipolar disorder, pharmacological therapy, psychotherapy, psychoeducation. And they found that in the sample, approximately half of the patients continued to struggle with depressive symptoms throughout the study, and also a significant portion continued to struggle with manic symptoms. Another way to see that is in the excess of treatment. We know that this is still a problem. It's getting better, but it's still a challenge. In spite of that, we see that there has been a steady increase in the prescription of psychotropic medications. Nowadays, antidepressants and antipsychotics are among the most commonly prescribed medications in the clinical practice. Despite that increase, we are not seeing a very significant improvement in outcomes. In contrast with other areas of medicine, where we are seeing steady improvement in mortality rates, functional outcomes, we are not seeing, the example here, an improvement for, in rates of suicide. They are very similar to how they were about 30 to 40 years ago. And that tells us that there is an urgency here in finding better, innovative approaches to help this population. And there is a consensus nowadays from multiple lines of evidence that one of the major obstacles to improve these outcomes is on the way we define these illnesses. We know that mood disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, are extremely heterogeneous conditions. They are characterized by a combination of multiple, sometimes disparate, signs and symptoms. And these deeper signs and symptoms do indicate that perhaps they are also underlying by variable, different pathophysiological mechanisms. And that's where comes the idea of studying alternative pathways, specifically in this case here today, the metabolic inflammatory pathway. And that's also informed by the very common overlap between mood disorders and metabolic comorbidities. The case here is diabetes mellitus. Multiple studies, including meta-analytic studies, have shown a very high instance uh, and prevalence of type 2 diabetes mellitus in the mood disorders population, with rates even two times higher than the general population. But interestingly, these risks seem to be bidirectional. When we talk about metabolic comorbidities in a mood disorder population, frequently we think that these are a result from pharmacological treatment, weight gain medications, we frequently think that this is a result of diet or lifestyle differences, and no question that they are relevant, but they do not seem to be able to fully explain this high prevalence and instance. And a way to see that is to look on a different way and to see that the risk of developing a mood disorder is also uh, significantly increased in individuals with metabolic disorders. So this is a study that involved 800,000 people they were followed, individuals with diabetes had a 2.6 high risk of developing either bipolar disorder or depression. And one of the most interesting findings is that if they were treated, in this case with oral antidiabetic medications, this risk was mitigated and became uh, very similar to the general population, which has very interesting implications for preventive approaches. Uh, diabetes also uh, involves or implicates a number of bio the biological substrates that are thought to also underlying psychiatric disorders. So diabetes has uh, uh, a multiple uh, preclinical data, animal data has shown that diabetes is able to impact uh, uh, neuronal plasticity, is able to impact neuronal proliferation, neuronal survival. This is an animal study showing that in an animal model of diabetes that both the neuronal proliferation and the neuronal survival were impacted. And as a result, we often see also uh, both functional and structural consequences. So 
it's very well established nowadays that individuals with diabetes have a high instance of cognitive impairment, which is frequently of similar magnitude that we document in the mood disorder population. And this cognitive deficit seems to be underlined by structural abnormalities. This study here show white matter uh, 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 abnormalities, uh, which were very frequent in the diabetic population. So this data suggests or indicates that there is a convergence of pathophysiological mechanisms. Both the population, uh, in individual with mood disorders and the population with metabolic comorbidities do share a number of risk factors and do also seem to share a number of biological substrates or mediators. We talked a little bit about inflammation, about HBA access, about genetic risk factors that are, seem to be common for both of these conditions. But it seems to be more than just an overlap or more than just a coincidence. There is data nowadays that a metabolic comorbidity is able to modify or moderate the substrates of a mood disorder. So I'm going to give two examples today. One is regarding oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is one of the biological systems most commonly implicated in the pathogenesis of mood disorders. Oxidative stress is related to uh, uh, neuroplasticity also, uh, dysregulated uh, uh, oxidative stress is linked to neurotoxicity. Uh, this, this here is uh, 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 the superoxidismutase, which is one of the key regulators, is an antioxidant enzyme. We show here that in healthy controls, the higher the HbA1ac, so the higher the glycate hemoglobin, the higher it is the superoxidismutase. And this seems to be protective, high HB1NC or diabetes. There is data showing that this uh, is associated to an increase in reactive oxygen species, which leads to oxidative stress. So increasing an antioxidant enzyme is protective, mitigates this effect. But when we look at the bipolar disorder population, we see the opposite effect. This enzyme seems to decrease with increasing uh, glycate hemoglobin, indicating that this population is less resilient to a metabolic stressor. Uh, another example is the BDNF, which is a neurotrophin, is a protein that's implicated in also the regulation of neuroplasticity. There is consistent evidence that this neurotrophin is also abnormal in the mood disorder population. There is also evidence, and we also show here, that uh, uh, the BDNF levels uh, increase with uh, longer illness duration or with the accumulation of mood episodes. There is evidence that mood episodes are toxic. So an increase in this neurotrophin would be considered a compensatory protective mechanism. But when we stratify individuals with bipolar disorder based on the presence of prediabetes and diabetes, we see an opposite relationship. So while euglycemic individuals, we see this increase in protective BDNF, we see the opposite in individuals with diabetes or prediabetes, again indicating lower resilience to an stressor. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. And this will result, again, in both structural and functional abnormalities in the brain. So one of the most consistent findings in imaging studies is decrease in gray matter volumes in both limbic and prefrontal areas. But when we look at patients with metabolic comorbidities, with diabetes, with prediabetes, we observe a much more intense decrease in the volume of these areas which is significantly, uh, uh, the volume is significantly lower than glycemic controls, but is also significantly lower than individuals with bipolar disorder that do not have diabetes. And this has led to the hypothesis that has been tested and developed by our group. Again, going back to the idea of heterogeneity, uh, it's not reasonable to assume that every single patient with bipolar disorder or with depression will have a metabolic comorbidity. It's also not possible to assume that for every single patient, the metabolic comorbidity will be as impactful as has been described. It's much more likely that there is a subpopulation. This subpopulation will uh, um, have more prominently this overlap of environmental risk factors, this overlap of substrates, of biological mechanisms, and also the overlap of clinical presentations. They are more likely to have emotional, behavior, or cognitive alter alterations associated to a metabolic dysfunction, either obesity, diabetes, or metabolic syndrome. And this is the subpopulation that is more promising in terms of testing or developing preventive therapeutic approaches. 
if we are going to test an intervention that targets a metabolic comorbidity or targets a metabolic pathway, it's important to find the people that are more likely to respond to it. So now moving a little bit, moving, moving forward to the therapeutic implications, uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about intranasal insulin. Intranasal insulin is a very interesting tool. It delivers insulin directly to the central nervous system with very little peripheral absorption. Insulin in the brain has a lot of physiological uh, uh, relevant activities. It's a neuronal modulator. It does seem to have also a pro-connectivity and a pro-cognitive effect. There are a number of studies showing that a single dose of intranasal insulin is able to improve cognitive function, is also able to improve functional connectivity on how the areas of the brain are talking to each other. So there is data of this clinical trial that used for individuals with diabetes and healthy controls. They did observe a uh, an improvement in cognitive function that was correlated with an improvement with functional connectivity. And there is also data showing that these effects seem to be relevant in a mood disorder population. This is data from our group. Uh, we used internasal insulin for eight weeks, uh, 60 individuals with bipolar disorder, and we did observe a significant improvement in the TMTB, the trail making test B, which is a test that measures executive function. So which is a very promising uh, and interesting finding. Uh, the other agent that I would like to bring today uh, are the GLP-1 receptors uh, agonist, the, uh, specifically the liraglutide, Victoza. Uh, Dr. Lovshin will talk a little bit in more detail about the physiological and biological mechanisms, uh, but just broadly speaking, it is a molecule that uh, has a, a, an effect on glucose utilization. It facilitates glucose both in the periphery and the central nervous system. It is one of a well-established treatment for diabetes. There is preclinical and animal data indicating that it also has a neuroprotective or pro-cognitive effect. Uh, we are, Roger discussed a little bit about the domain approach or the RDOC approach. That's what we are trying to do with this study. So we are recruiting individuals regardless of psychiatric diagnosis. We are just interested in individuals that have a cognitive dysfunction. And we're also trying to integrate to this clinical trial, a neurobiological approach, especially using integrated mechanisms. So we're not interested in just on showing a cognitive or a functional improvement. We want to see how that relates to neurocircuitry or to neural systems. And so far we have preliminary data. We completed four weeks of Victoza for five individuals. We have observed so far a global improvement in cognitive function. These are tests that are measuring executive function, psychomotor speed, memory, and learning. And we have documented, as I said, a significant improvement. More interesting, we also observed an improvement in a marker of neuronal integrity, specifically in this area of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a key component of the executive control network. This marker, the NAA and acetyl aspartate, is considered to be a marker of neuronal integrity. We observed a significant improvement, a significant increase in these markers after the use of liraglutide, indicating that liraglutide is maybe having a significant neuroprotective effect. But even more interesting, we observe a strong correlation be in, between the changes in these markers and the improvement in cognitive function. So the patients that improved more in the TMTB, the test of executive functions, or the patients that have the higher increase in this marker. And again, we talked a lot about heterogeneity, so we want to see, we want to know who are the patients that are going to respond better to these aims. So here we analyzed what were the effects of baseline insulin resistance, here measured by this index, the home IR, and we observed that the patients that have higher baseline home IR were the patients that responded better, both in terms of cognitive function as well in terms of the neuronal marker uh, or, or the marker of neuronal integrity. Importantly, it, was not, it were not the changes in this market. It was not the weight loss. It was not the improvement in insulin resistance that led to the improvement. It was the baseline, indicating that maybe this is a subpopulation more susceptible to improving, to responding well, to intervention that targets a metabolic system. Uh, so this, uh, this data and these uh, studies are results, uh, Roger mentioned, of a, a successful collaboration between our Brazilian group and our Canadian group, and there are a lot of people that I would like to uh, thank. Uh, none of this work would be possible without them. Thank you.